It's a season of hope It's a season of joy So we sing Joy to the world The Lord is come Let earth receive a King Let every heart prepare Him room And heaven and nature sing And heaven and nature sing Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ by hills and floods, while hills and plains repeat the sound in joy, repeat the sound in joy. Sound He rules the earth, He rules the earth with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glory. And wonders of His love And wonders of His love And wonders, wonders of His love Oh, let's sing of the wonders of His grace We could ask or think of Jesus is His name Joy to the world Thank you for your great love We exhort you, Lord. The Word of God says, Therefore, let us run this race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. This year was a year that challenged our faith, that challenged what we believe in. But I believe God took us to a place where our faith was tested and most importantly our faith was built but if you are struggling today and if you are still finding it hard to believe in the Lord to believe that He's in control the key is simple don't fix your eyes on your situation but fix your eyes on Jesus He is the author and He is the perfecter of your faith and as you fix your eyes on Him, you can see everything else just fade away. And He will empower you with His Spirit. And He will surround you with His presence. And He will fill you with His love. And that is what we need this morning. God, I look to You. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me wisdom. See things 
things like you do God, I look to you You're where my help comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do God, I look to you I won't be overwhelmed Give me vision To see things like you do God, I look to you You're where my help comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do And I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, Lord, one more time. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do.
Jesus, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, we know that the victory will come from the Lord. We know that we will see victory on the day of battle as we fix our eyes on Jesus and not on the things of the world and not on man and not on even a church, but we fix our eyes on Jesus and He will allow us to see the victory over our situations, over our trials, over our sicknesses. The defeat of our sin. Let's bless his name. Let's bless his name. Thank you, Jesus. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm going to see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord Belongs to you, Lord We know we will see a victory In Jesus' name The weapon may be formed but it won't prosper When the darkness falls It won't prevail For the God I serve Knows only how to try Cause my God will never fail I know that my God will never fail Come on, let's declare this morning sing my God will never fail in faith as loud as you can sing my God will never one more time my God my God will never fail cause I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the
Father, we pray as your word is about to be spoken right now that you will open our hearts, O oh Master. Make our hearts good soil for the word of God to be planted, Lord. Your word says that your words will not remain void without accomplishing what it was sent for. And I pray that today it will not just be words of a man, but it will be those words of God that will accomplish what it was sent for. Changing hearts, breaking chains, healing the sick, delivering your people, building up faith, O oh Lord Jesus. Let it be a word that transforms our lives, that draws us closer to you and helps us learn more about you, Father. We commit the word and all who are listening today into your mighty hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. It's great to connect with you once again. Uh, we've come to the second week of December in 2020. And what a year it has been. I don't think any one of us would have been able to predict what happened this year. Uh, but I want to tell you that God is still in control. God is still in control. And I want to leave you with a message. What do you see? What do you see? Even as we prepare to enter a new year, I believe that God is going to use this to prepare you for the season ahead. Now, when you take things that we see, there are things that we do not see to our naked eye. And we might need a bit of help from another object to see them. You can use a binoculars to uh, look at something far away. Uh, for those of you who love nature and go to Yala or Vilpattu, uh, you, you'll use a binoculars to, to look at the animals that are far away, that are distant. Or for those of you who love a uh, telescope to look into the stars, to see something very far away, very distant. But with the use of that tool, you'll be able to see more details than you see to the naked eye. If you're a photographer, you might have used a lens. You might use a 400 or a 600 millimeter lens that will zoom in and capture a bird or a flower or, or look at the details of something really minute that you might not see with the naked eye. Or you might use a microscope to, to look at a bacteria or a, or a fungus, something growing, and look at the details of it. But sometimes we need additional support to look at something small but significant that you might not see with your own eyes. And I believe that this is the same with even the spiritual realm. There are things that we do not see with our natural eyes that we need to connect with the Spirit to see what God is doing in this season. The Bible says that, that our battle is not just against flesh and blood. It is not just with what we see in front of us, but there's something going on that God is directing us into that we need to see the way God sees it. And it's important that we see into the spiritual realm. So I want to pose that question with you once again. What do you see? What do you see? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, and I'm going to read from verse 1 to 9. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 9. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judea, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. 
he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water he ate and drank and then he lay down again the angel of the lord came back to him a second time and touched him and said get up and eat for the journey is too much for you so he got up and ate and drank strengthened by the food he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached horeb the mountain of god there he went into the cave and spent the night it starts off by saying now ahab told jezebel everything elijah had done how he had killed the prophets with the sword looking at the previous chapter we see that uh, elijah confronts ahab confronts a king a powerful man he you see that he took on 450 prophets of baal this one prophet took on 450 prophets of baal we see that he rained fire from heaven a amazing miracle you see right after that that elijah calls on the rain it had not rained but elijah predicts that it's going to rain and it happened and it says that thereafter he ran on foot faster than the king could get to the city and that was all supernatural and god was was using elijah in an amazing way All this was good because Elijah saw the presence of the Lord through his success and victory. Because he was winning, he thought that he was connected to God and and God was with him. And often when things are going our way, we feel connected to God, we feel spiritual. But I want to leave with you this thought. Success attracts adversity. Success attracts adversity elijah's success attracted adversity as a king uh, communicates this to jezebel she says i am going to kill you i am going to kill you and she sends his message and we think that sometimes serving god should only bring us joy and favor If things go our way we think that yeah God is with us God is blessing us but I want you to know that even through adversity God is with you God is with you you might not think it you might not feel that way you wish the circumstances were different but God is with you Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 and 7 says and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages in the coming ages he might display the surpassing riches of his grace demonstrated by his kindness to us in Christ Jesus these very words were written by the apostle Paul from the prison Here is a man who writes his words that says that God's goodness God's grace that we are going to experience it but it's going to also be something eternal and is writing to us from prison amidst adversity 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 17 and 18 says for a light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal glory that is far beyond comparison So we fix our eyes not on what is seen but what is unseen for what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal This is when you need to know why you do what you do you need to know who you serve Paul writing to Timothy says this he says I am suffering as I am yet this is no cause for shame because I know who I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day see my friends if you don't see the news and you don't see the times around us and and you don't understand that even as we speak right now biblical prophecy is being fulfilled you have been blinded i'm not 
sure whether you like to hear this. I'm not sure that you who are connected online, whether you believe, whether you're not, where you stand with regards to the word of Lord. But for those who believe that the word of the Lord is God's revelation to us, there were things that were written thousands of years ago in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, and it speaks about the end. It speaks about what's going to happen. And this world is going to come to an end. With all our best science, with all our best predictions, the Bible says this world will come to an end. But there's something more to look for beyond this world. And this is a time to wake up. This is a time to study scripture. This is a time to study for yourself what is going to take place. See, everyone right now is hyped up about the vaccine. They, they think that they'll get a cure that this disease will pass and that things are going to go back to normal. But if you read Revelation chapter 6, it says when the fourth seal was broken, one fourth of the population of the earth was destroyed. One fourth of the population of earth was destroyed. Just a couple of weeks ago on, on Sunday, I remember Sunday afternoon of service, uh, I, I left to Madampe. Uh, to buy some plants. I, I love my gardening. I, I love buying different types of plants. I had sources, contact, and I went all the way to Madhambi to buy some plants. And I had just been redoing my, my parents' garden. I had been just cutting the grass and growing some new plants. So I had gone to Madhampe uh, to buy the plants when I got a call uh, saying that my mother was not too well and uh, they were taken into hospital for tests. And... Uh, my father asked me whether I could bring the children over before she left, uh, which was kind of, uh, I mean, weird because she goes to tests all the time. And, and it was kind of a normal thing over the last few years to see her go, go for tests. But since I was out, my wife took the children in. Uh, I did not rush to get back home. I was there buying the plants and uh, doing all of that. I remember I, I got back a late evening and they were still at home. But I, I, I remember I had a chat with mom, but I, I, I didn't even have a, a, a profound conversation with her. I didn't, there were no hugs and kisses and vice versa. It was a normal thing. She was going to go to hospital, do her checkups and, and then come back a couple of days later. That's how it always worked. I remember going to hospital on uh, Monday night and uh, even as she was checking out and, and being moved to another hospital, uh, again, I, I, was, I, I just spoke to her, I, I got the kids on FaceTime and I connected to her, but I did not have a deep conversation with her because I knew that she was going to come back home. I knew that things were going to be normal and, and, and I could always talk to her when she gets back home. And I didn't want to kind of bother her, so I was seated out of the room and uh, the next time I met her, she was not conscious. And a day later, she passed away. See, I knew in my head that she was going to come back home. I knew that things were going to be normal. I had taken for granted that no, this can't happen. This can't happen. See, sometimes we can take for granted the time we have left on earth. Sometimes we can take for granted the people around us that the Lord has placed in our life. Sometimes you can take for granted your children. And you might think that, no, there's no way that they will pass away before you. There's no way. They have so much years ahead of them. But the thing is, is, the Bible says that we have one life, one death, and one judgment. And we need to make it count. We need to make it count. See, it will not affect you till it affects you. If I knew that my mom was going to pass away, I would have had a more meaningful conversation with her. If I just knew that that was the last time I'll see her. I would have spent more time with her. But I knew that she was going to come back. And this time it, it 
hit close to home it, it hit me because we never know when's the last time we will see someone and are we intentionally investing in their lives are you communicating the word of god into their lives see after someone's passed there's nothing we can do to add merit to their lives after you and i pass there's nothing anyone else can do to add merit to our lives we have one life one death and a judgment we are given a clear mandate the bible says go and make disciples of all nations teach them the word of god the israelites were told teach your children and your children's children tell the stories of god's goodness daily share it with them encourage them build them up we are given a clear mandate see the bible says ask god for the nations ask god for the nations and I, i i kind of think that today too many people are asking the lord not for the nations but designations they want positions they want titles and they want all of this but they're not asking the lord for the nations and i want to challenge you even as we've come to the end of 2020 and we're looking forward to 2021 what are you asking god for what do you see in the spiritual realm what are you asking the lord for ask god for the nations see it's not easy because success attracts adversity and you see that as soon as adversity comes elijah starts running away but turn to someone and say your end is not your end turn to someone and say the end is not your end there is hope as much as success attracts adversity there's provision amidst adversity there's provision amidst adversity verse 4 to 6 says i have had enough lord says elijah take my life i'm no better than my ancestors it says then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep but it says all at once the angel touched him and said get up and eat he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked on hot coals and a jar of water it says he looked around the provision was available the provision was there but he said he looked around and then he saw i was i was thinking of this and i was visualizing this and i thought hey if if it was bread on on hot coals and it was fresh bread he should have got the aroma and it says the bread was right next to his head but he missed that and he had to be woken up and shown by the angel that god had given him provision amidst his adversity see your circumstances can blind you from seeing the provision the lord has placed in front of you i'm going to repeat that your circumstances can blind you from seeing the provision the lord has placed in front of you he was so caught up by his circumstances that he did not recognize the miracle taking place in in front of him see the israelites were like this you see the journey through the wilderness they were so caught up in what they were going through they were so caught up in in their benefits and their blessing and their land and and the land that god had promised them and god blessing them and their prosperity that god was amongst them but they failed to see it it said the lord went before them in a cloud and went with them through a, a fire a, a pillar of fire but it said they failed to see god who was amongst them and sometimes we too can get caught up in blessing and provision and and god bless me god help me god help me to get through this god sustain me forgetting that god has called you and me to be a blessing unto the nations go beyond yourself and i want to challenge you once again even through this crisis even through this hard season what do you see and it says once again for the second time the lord encounters elijah and i want to focus on three points that he shares the first thing it says is get up get up 
you need to determine to move from where you are. See, Elijah was there and he said, I'm Lord, kill me, I'm done. Uh, my life is over. There was a pity party going on and, and he's lying there under the bush and he says, my life is over. The Lord says, get up. And some of you need to hear this. You need to wake up. You need to get up and move from where you are. You think your life is over. You think your ministry is over. You think your effectiveness is over. God says, get up and move. Move. There's something happening in the spiritual realm that you can't see. You can see only the physical. You can see only things in front of you that are not falling into place. But God says, I am working. I am doing something. You are a part of it. And it says, you need to get up. Even through adversity, there's a mission to be accomplished. Mark Cain in a quote says this, the first step towards success is taken when you refuse to be captive to the environment in which you first find yourself. You refuse the environment that you're in and you say, no, I'm going to move from here. You need to make a move from where you are. In Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, the Great Commission we know this, so I'm not going to read the whole portion of Scripture. Verse 18 says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus had already told him, Greater things than this you will do. And he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And he says, Therefore, go. Therefore, go. It calls for action. And it says, even as you go, remember that surely I will be with you. I am going to be with you even until the end of time. But you need to go. You don't wait till things fall into place. You don't wait till you think it's safe to come out. It says, no, you go. You need to make a move. Don't wait for the perfect time, for the perfect environment to do what the Lord has placed in your heart. You need to make a move. Do it now. The second thing it says is eat. Verse 8 says, So he got up, he ate and drank and strengthened by the food. It says he got up, he ate and drank and strengthened by the food. You need to nourish yourself for the journey ahead of you. You need to nourish yourself for the journey ahead of you. You need to prepare yourself. In Luke chapter 14, verse 27 and 28, Jesus speaks about the price you need to pay to follow Jesus. There's a price to be paid to follow Jesus. This titled the cost of discipleship in the Bible. And verse 27 says, And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? See, if you want to follow Jesus, there's a price to be paid. Sometimes we think that Christianity is all about coming and getting a miracle. No, I'm part of church because I want to be blessed. I want to live abundantly. I want to live uh, under the blessing. I want to get healings. I want to get everything done for free. You, God does not charge you and that's it. But while that is true and God does bless you, the Bible also says that God blesses you to be a blessing unto others. He told Abraham, I will bless you to be a blessing unto the nations. And God's blessing to you is not for you to enjoy all the benefits. It is for you to bless others. And it says, but if you want to be my disciple, it's not just about the blessing. You also need to go through adversity. You need to pick up the cross and follow Jesus. Kelai just sets out for 40 days after being nourished by the Lord. He said he got up, he ate, and then he sets out on a journey that took him 40 days through the wilderness to his destination. You remember in the Gospels, it speaks about Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, goes into the wilderness for 40 days and he comes out and he's, and he's tempted but he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus says, 
Yes, I am hungry. Yes, I need something to eat. But man does not live on bread alone. See, your preparation is not just physical. Yes, the angel told Elijah, eat some food so that you'll have physical strength. But I believe that even as we serve, that our physical, our emotional and our spiritual need to be watched. We need to develop our physical selves. We need to develop our emotions because the attack is real. The adversity is real. And we also need to develop our spirit life that we can face the attacks of the enemy. If you think that you are not going to be hurt serving the Lord, think again. You are going to be hurt. Let the Lord deal with it. Let the Lord deal with what's going on. But if you want to sustain yourself, if you want to get through this season, you need to nourish yourself physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Another commentary says this. It says, eat a second time, for otherwise the journey will be beyond your powers. You need to make a choice to build yourself up that you will survive this season. You need to make a choice to build yourself up. Otherwise, the afflictions will get to you. The third thing we see is there's a journey. It says, the journey ahead is too much for you. See, God has foreknowledge of the journey that you and I are going through. God has foreknowledge about our lives. Hebrews 12 says, we run with perseverance. We run with perseverance, the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. God knows our stories. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. He knows your past. He knows your present. He knows your future. See, God knows every detail about you. God does not make you do decisions, but He knows what you are going to do. God has foreknowledge of everything. And God knows the journey ahead of you. And, and God wants to partner with you to prepare you for the journey ahead. Here was 40 days without food. And he, he, it says he had to travel about 200 miles to get on this journey. 200 miles through the wilderness. And it says Elijah finally makes it there. He makes it to the mountain of the Lord. And you know what the Lord asks him? A very interesting question. It says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Now, this does not mean that God did not know what was going on, but he wanted Elijah to come to the realization that God was in control. And he wanted Elijah, because Elijah was on a pity party. Remember, he said, God, kill me. I am done. I am the only one left. There is no one. They have killed all the prophets. And, and God asked Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? That's a question God is asking some of you today. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Maybe this season got you down. Maybe this season has put you in a place where you lost your hope. Maybe this season got you in a place where you didn't think you're going to make it. But God still hasn't given up on you. God asks you, what are you doing here? God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. See, Elijah comes out of this victorious and it's not just Elijah's life that is transformed. We see Hazel, we see Jehu and we see Elisha being birthed out of this experience. Three great leaders in the nation were birthed out of this experience. I want to ask you this morning, what do you see? What do you see? Do you only see that which is physical around you? Or are you in line with what God is doing even in this season? God is moving. I believe the book of Joel that says in the last says, I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh, young and the old. I believe that season is coming. I believe that God is setting us up for revival. But where are you? What are you doing? What are you doing? Would you just take a moment with me to bow your heads in prayer? And I don't know how these months have been for you, 
But I know one thing, we can never have enough of the presence of God. So I just want to lead you in a prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your presence. I just thank you, Lord, that even in seasons where we can't see ahead of us, Lord, you say, come to me. Come to me, Lord, that you will show us, that you'll give us divine revelation of what is ahead. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll challenge your people, even amidst this season, Lord, that many don't have answers, Lord, that you will lead us to a place that we will raise up leaders, that we will disciple, that we will build up, that we'll share your hope with others, Lord, that many more Hazels, many more Jehus, many more Elishas will rise up, Lord, through this season. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, even amongst all the challenges. We give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I also want to challenge you that if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, see, this is not about Christianity. This is not about following another religion. This is not about this church or Calvary Center. Or I, I, I don't even know where you're connected from. But God is someone you need to partner with. And I just want to lead you in a quick prayer. And if you need assistance on the next step, do write into us, drop us a message on Facebook or, or on YouTube. And, and one of our leaders would love to get uh, connected with you and even connect you with a church close to where you are. But I want to lead you in this prayer. And if you could say this after me, Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I want to know you. Lord, I want to get to know if you are real. Lord, your word says that you will reveal yourself to those who earnestly seek. Jesus, I want to know you. Reveal yourself to me. God, connect me with a leader or a church that can help me on my journey. Forgive my sins and make me more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And uh, if you need prayer, do connect with us and we would love to minister to you.